We're back with Christoph Bertrand, who's the practice director at ESG. And we're going to talk about reinventing data protection and the disruptive impacts that AI and machine intelligence have on backup and recovery with some new fresh survey data and research that ESG has done around cyber resilience and recovery. Christoph, welcome. It's good to see you back in studio. We were here in December. Great to be here. Well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. So you have some recent uh, survey research that we're going to talk about here. But before we get deep into the, to the data, I wonder if you could share with the audience the background of the research, the demographics, the methodology, just take it, take it from there. Yeah, so uh, typically what we do is we speak to hundreds of uh, resp uh, respondents. They're uh, highly qualified IT professionals or cyber professionals, depending on the topic. Uh, and uh, typically it's North America, Western Europe, a uh, combination thereof, it depends on the nature of the, the research. So what it gives us, it's uh, essentially great data from end users. Not only do we get sentiment data, but we can quantify uh, what's going on, what the challenges are, what the opportunities are. So it's great data for both end users. What are your peers doing? What's going on? You're not alone, typically, is the reaction we get. But also for uh, vendors, we can get a good sense for what's going on in terms of trends, and that gives me the uh, ability to do more research as I detect, uh, you know, where I see smoke, as I detect problems, I know there's a fire, so I go do more research on those topics. Yeah, you guys have done this, and you've built on it for years, and, and because you have such domain expertise, you can ask the right questions. Now, a key finding in this recent survey, and if you guys could, you know, cue the first slide, was that 89% of respondents rank ransomware as a top five threat to the viability of their organization. But even more striking, that when I saw this data, is nearly two thirds say that ransomware is one of the top three threats to the viability of the organization. So this tells us that firms really aren't prepared. Right, and by the way, uh, the question we asked was really around the viability of the business, not about IT or IT infrastructure or anything like that. It was truly about the business. So the numbers are staggering. Why? Because this is a business issue. Uh, now we're talking about uh, existential type of problems here, uh, extension level type of problems with ransomware attacks. So what that changes is also the nature of uh, the people who get involved. So here's the good news for IT professionals. They will have the uh, ear of their executives. They will have access to more budget. They will have access to more resources. But here's the bad news. It's a business issue. It means you have new processes, new teams, uh, and you have to really think through the technology. Uh, I'm going to say one more time, but here the nature of the problem has changed, and that's really what's at stake here. Uh, you are uh, critical in IT now uh, in your ability to help de-risk the business, uh, and that's a big deal. Yeah, so it's not just a technology case. It's not just about you know hardware failing. It's a it's a whole house type of of, of, of organizational business case that maybe IT people aren't used to making. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's also forcing some conversations across different groups that maybe we're not really talking before. Uh, let, let me put it this way: the minute the uh, security guy calls the backup and recovery guy to say, hey, "I've got a problem. Can you help me recover?" Well, guess what? It's too late. <laughs> you should have been talking before. Okay, nearly 70% of the respondents in, in this survey said that recovery from a ransomware attack is fundamentally different than recovering from other types of disasters like fires or floods. We have a graphic on this. It's a pie chart. Why, Christoph, do people think this and what are some of the salient differences in your view? Right, so I like to say that uh, disaster recovery is dead. Now we're really in the era of cyber recovery and, and really cyber resilience. So it's not just marketing buzz or vendors making you know, pivots and messaging and PR. This is real. What's happening is that uh, traditional disasters are not traditional anymore. You could see the hurricane come, right? You could shut things down and fail over to a secondary center or to the cloud, whatever the case may be. But now things are different. You don't know what's going to hit you. You don't know how it's going to hit you. You don't know when. Uh, could be bad, could be really bad, or could be benign. So the, the processes uh, have to change. The teams have to change. And what's going on is, I believe, today what we're seeing is that because there's so much data, uh, so much complexity in IT environments to begin with, what we would call technical debt, and teams that are not aligned to face these new challenges, well, people run around with their hair on fire in some cases, and it's a big disruption. So what's the net net? We talked about it being a business existential issue. Let me sort of bring it back to data protection, backup recovery. The traditional metrics, such as RPO or RTO, used to be pretty well managed. 
we got to a good place. And now they're just out the window because you have to really think the recovery process, you have to be more preemptive, you have to do a lot of different things that you didn't have to, to do before. So the combination of cybersecurity, traditional disaster recovery, data management is happening. And that's happening against a, a background or backdrop of, of uh, a lot of data you know, uh, being generated around AI uh, and a lot of investments going in all new areas of technology. So people are running behind uh, this train constantly. So uh, a change is needed and technology can help, uh, but the processes and the people will have to evolve as well. I can't tell you how many times I heard during the pandemic, I'm sure you did too, that we were way too focused on disaster recovery versus just our overall business resilience. Okay, so that was a catalyst and people are clearly still catching up based on that survey data. Now you've got the AI wave comes in. So we want to talk about AI and data protection. People don't often think about those two topics going together, but, but should they and if so, why? Right, so I think there are two facets to this, two uh, sides of the coin, right? There's the uh, creation of uh, data that, they, uh, that AI is generating. So think of it as a new workload, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, so as if we didn't have enough data, now we're generating even more data, you know, trained data, model data, for, whether for analytics, for gen AI, you name it. So, uh, and we've, we've, we've looked at that and it's, it's starting to become significant. I mean, before we know it, it's going to be very, very significant. Uh, it's only in a petabyte range already. So you've got to protect that. The reality is uh, it's not really quite happening. Now, second, the second aspect uh, is how do I use ML and AI uh, in the context of easing my data protection, my ransomware recovery? Uh, so it's, it's the use case uh, of AI and ML applied to data protection and backup and recovery. So those are very different conversations. Of course, they are intertwined to a large extent, uh, but they're different. Protect the generation uh, of new data is number one. And then secondly is generating uh, um, better data protection with Gen AI, with AI and ML. To the latter to really reduce some of those mundane tasks. The former, I mean, people talking a lot about synthetic data, uh, right. that, that the building digital twins, things of that nature, that's, there's a real IP in there. You don't want to lose that. You don't want, you know, certainly don't want that to get stolen. All right, so this next data point is something that I'd like you to address. Guys, maybe bring up the uh, AI data backup gap slide. Only about a third of respondents say they regularly back up more than half of their AI generated data. So Christoph, what does this tell you? Why is it important to protect data that AI generates? Well, I mean, it's very simple. Uh, I like to follow the money. Is it worth money to you or not? And if it's not, then don't you know, forget about it. Don't worry about it. It's uh, unlikely <laughs> not to be important. Why? Because you've just spent a lot of money and, and, and you know, uh, great skill sets on generating uh, new models and new data to, uh, to train more models. So this data you're generating with AI is key to you. It's important to your business. You're doing this for a reason. Why not protect it? Now, it's typical when there's a new workload or a new process or a new use case, sometimes it takes time for backup and recovery uh, processes to catch up. So I think we're seeing this at, at, you know, at play here. But you know, with the speed at which AI is evolving, uh, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I think we're past the big you know, high of last year. It was all buzzy around AI, but it was PR. Well, now people are looking at actual use cases, they're actually pushing those out, they're actually investing. So now they have to uh, follow up with the backup piece. They have to protect those investments. I look at it this way, whether you're using AI for Gen AI, to supplement a business process or customer experience, or whether it's for analytics to better understand your business, for example, build new products, it's actually pure IP. And that is worth a lot of money to you. So data has become the business in many ways here. Well, and images are becoming you know, the thing. And actually AI is getting pretty good at, at, at building images. And so that's going to drive a lot of data. Right, and, and you want to be able to, for instance, I would presume say, okay, this image was actually created without using external IP. It was done by our own, own IP. And so actually having sort of a trail of what actually happened, an audit trail of the, whether it's the prompt or what the source of that right. data is, is, is going to be critical. I mean, and it's discoverable. Exactly, so you get into uh, this, this uh, question of what I would call data management on steroids now, right? Because you have to make sure the data you use, first of all, is usable, right? You can't use private uh, data just like that. Uh, it has to be masked, has to be anonymized. So there is a compliance and, and really a governance con conversation uh, leading to also uh, this notion of do I have quality data 
that I'm using in my models. So this, this idea of quality of data is, is becoming very key. But here's the thing, you actually have a lot of this data already in-house, not just production, but in your backups, in your archives. So what can you use? What should you use? How do you reuse it? Uh, these are very important questions. Uh, and then as you produce results and new value out of these data assets, how do you protect those assets? I wonder if, I mean, it's, it's got to be becoming a board level discussion. It's got to be bubbling up just like cyber was. It, you know, data protection has become a fundamental component. We talked about this in December. It's no longer an adjacency. Now you've got this AI data protection, a whole new set of processes. It's, it's got to be bubbling to the top, don't you think? Just like uh, ransomware or cyber uh, protection uh, or resilience is an executive or board level issue, the same thing is happening here. I think what we're seeing though, it's early stages. So there are many, many challenges. Uh, that means uh, there's also an ecosystem that's uh, sort of forming. And in order to be successful, you really need to think through your processes, but also the investments you're making in technology, the type of uh, vendors and partners you want to work with, uh, in or, and of course, the skill sets you need to build to, to get to the point where you can uh, safely generate uh, these, uh, these models uh, if you want to use them in your business. Uh, you mentioned synthetic data, that's another topic. I think uh, there'll, be, there'll be more in the future about that. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you are looking to make, uh, you know, for quality in the data so that the models do not hallucinate, so that the data you generate is compliant, and so that you uh, are responsible. Uh, as an organization. So this notion of responsible AI is a very, very hot topic we're also researching uh, in my practice. Early days and, and a lot of unknowns. Now, more than half of the organizations in your survey said that AI and ML will improve their ability to recover data after a ransomware attack. A large portion of the respondents also said it's going to help them improve their RPO and RTO posture. Guys, bring up the next graphic if you would. So better RPO, RTO as it relates to recovering from ransomware attack and only in the topic of Gen AI, only 1% said Gen AI will not help with improving the backup recovery process. So people are pretty positive about AI. What else did you learn from this data and are you as optimistic? I am as optimistic as they are. I think it's going to be um, uh, absolutely key. I'd like to talk about this notion of generative data protection, uh, really, where you can really interact and ask questions like, well, do I have the right recovery plans in place? But, you know, tying this back to ransomware, do, can I actually automatically generate a plan in plain English or at least in understandable terms that can be then uh, executed by another part of the team, right? Uh, talking about, again, this interaction of multiple teams. Uh, the automation is like the driving car, the self-driving car. Do you really want to fully take your, uh, your hands off the wheel, the steering wheel, and do you need a steering wheel? Yes, you do, right? It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, but there's plenty you can do to automate, to do more. And the reason why you have to do this is because it's just too much data. Processes are very complex and the nature of the people operating uh, the environment has changed and not, they're not uh, PhDs in backups, right? <laughs> or PhDs in ransomware. Uh, those people don't really exist anymore uh, if they ever did. So you have to have those tools. And I think Gen AI and AI in general uh, in ML in data protection is absolutely key. That's going to be, in my opinion, what makes a difference in the future between the vendors who win the vendors who do not. And it'll be an evolution. You know, it's like full self-driving, right? We every day we use automation capabilities when we drive. We're not full self-driving quite yet, but it's super helpful. And I would imagine this is going to be a similar trajectory. All right, we've been talking all day about building cyber resilient infrastructure. What's your take on Dell's announcements in that regard? Also, uh, first of all, when it comes to we talked about AI too. I think you know they are clearly an established leader both in cyber resiliency, uh, with great solutions uh, on on this topic, uh, and of course a key player uh, and key partner when it comes to uh, AI infrastructure, uh, hardware and software, and and really great solutions. So definitely uh, not a big surprise to see that uh, we're seeing this continued investment in the portfolio. Uh, definitely. Great news for existing uh, users of data domain. Uh, I think this is a, a couple of new pro um, uh, platforms here that are going to change not only the performance uh, characteristics of what they have in the environment, but it's uh, also about uh, the reliability. Uh, I like also the fact that there's plenty of built-in security uh, in, uh, in the platform, uh, starting at the uh, supply chain, really, literally, supply mm -hmm. chain of, of the actual uh, system. So that's very powerful. And then uh, there were other uh, components to the announcement, um, also around cloud and, and leveraging AI, so cloud data protection. So 
you know, uh, I think as it when it comes down to cyber resilience, uh, Dell has uh, a very established uh, reputation, uh, thousands and thousands of customers to prove it, and this announcement only confirms uh, their leadership. And I think I expect to see actually uh, even more uh, in the next few quarters uh, because the problem's not going away. Uh, they're solving it really well, and there are plenty of customers who would love to be able to use uh, easy to uh, deploy solutions. So. They fit the bill. We love having you as a guest because you always bring the perspective and the data. So thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. And thank you for spending some time with us today to participate in building cyber resilience on trusted data protection infrastructure made possible by Dell Technologies and Intel. Remember, this episode and all its segments and the short takes are all available on demand at thecube.net with more coverage and written content on siliconangle.com. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.